Well, I think we can get started. It's 3.30. Um, welcome everyone back to the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate uh, seminar series. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Zhang Zhu Yu, uh, who's an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences at the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign. Um, Jean Zhu is a former postdoc at the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate, uh, so it's great to have him back. Um, he received his PhD at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, working with Emily Elliott, and he has specialized in isotope geochemist. And um, Jean Zhu's work uses a lot of um, stable isotope logs and isotopomers to trace reactive nitrogen flow. Um, so he's a real expert in that field. Um, and today he's going to be talking about linking water age and nitrogen cycling in tile drained agricultural systems. So this is a great topic for our department. Um, so welcome, Zhangji. Thank you, Tim. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure to be back and talking with you guys. And I'm very excited to see a lot of familiar names in the audience. So again, thanks for the opportunity. So yeah, as uh, indicated by the title today, I'm gonna present some work that I have been doing since I started in uh, U of I. It's about nitrogen cycling and water age uh, dynamics in intelligent agricultural systems. So we're um, living in this uh, upper Midwest region, and we know this is one of the most productive region in the world in terms of corn and soybean production. And But the side effect is there is a lot of nutrient loss from this region. And uh, you can see in 2007, EPA called for a reduction plan. So to call for a 15% reduction by 2015 and by 45% uh, 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 ultimately. But if you look at the right, so at least by 2015, we didn't see any improvement, at least uh, from the standpoint that the, the total nitrogen load measured at the mouth of the Mississippi River Basin. So there were a lot of publications kind of arguing the importance of tail drainage in this region as a hotspot of nitrogen loss. So for example, for this one by David, David et al. published in 2010, basically linked those uh, areas with extensive tail drainage uh, to the nitrate, uh, nitrate yield within the entire Mississippi River Basin. So we know those subsurface tail drainage is one of the reasons why this region has been so productive because the increased soil infiltration rate helped to uh, create a very arrayed array and a root zone for crop production. But again, the side effect is it provides a kind of shortcut for the rapid delivery of water and nutrients from surface soil horizons directly to surface waters. There are a lot of kind of uh, practices, money, and uh, have been invent, uh, invested, devoted to reduce nutrient loss from tail drain field. And I believe uh, we're all familiar with this one right here, the 4R kind of strategy. So it's really about a strategy to take better care of fertilizer management to try to reduce the loss. But what I show right here is a recent kind of synthesized study led by uh, Chris, Ten Chris Tenson. So this is published in 2015. Basically, these authors gathered, uh, I believe, thousands uh, site years of data from the field and tried to detect any kind of significant impact of 4R on tail drainage uh, nutrient loss. But unfortunately, they didn't kind of detect any significant differences in tau nitrate load between um, different nitrogen application timing or uh, different application method. So in my opinion, this is somehow kind of inconsistent with the current strong focuses on uh, fertilizer management as a, and a conservation measure to reduce nutrient loss on tailgen fields. So actually one of those potential explanations for the lack of significant improvement, either at small scale or at bigger scale, is the presence of a large um, legacy store. I'm not quite sure if um, everybody familiar with this paper, but it is a recent paper published in 2017 
in science. So this basically group of author, uh, authors basically argue that there is a large or huge um, storage reservoir pre present somewhere in this um, Mississippi River Basin. So the presence of this legacy uh, store really kind of mask any improvement or management effect on the total nitrogen load from the basin. So this idea is illustrated in this figure right here. So um, this basically is a breakdown of the total nitrogen based on their age. If you look at this 2020, year 2020, so according to these authors, about 30 to 40% of total nitrogen measure at the mouth of Mississippi River Basin was dated 30 years ago. That's the nitrogen coming into this system 30 years ago. So that really presents a huge legacy effect. And they also went on to conclude that if we stop all the agricultural activity today, the water quality impact will, will last for decades to come. So these authors also divide two different types of legacy stores. One is biogeochemical, the other is hydrological. So according to their definition, this biogeochemical uh, legacy effect is all about those chronic um, fertilizer input, residue input to the soil system, which has built up a really large organic nitrogen pool, which can be mineralized and released to the environment over long term. The other is hydrological legacy effect, which essentially is those nitrogen stored very deep in the subsurface, like those in really deep groundwater aquifers, because the turnover rate in those deep aquifers is slow. So that means the transport is slow and the nitrogen stored there can have a long lasting impact uh, for surface water quality. So like I said, this study really sparked a lot of ongoing discussion debate about this legacy store. But as I know, one critic about this study is, is that these authors did not specifically consider the impact of Taldrian watersheds. We know the installation of those subsurface drains, Taldrians have altered the hydrology and biogeochemistry of this system, but we really don't know what kind of impact they provide for this nutrient loss and dynamics at large scale. Um, so pretty much as soon as I started here in URBI, I started to look at this tail drainage, the tail drain watersheds. So the watershed I have been working with is this one right here. It's called Upper Embar River Watershed. So it's not really far away from our campus. Our campus is right here in Champaign. And so it's about 30 minutes driving uh, to the mouth or to the outlet of this uh, watershed where there is a USGS gauge station. So the watershed is pretty large. It's about 480 square kilometers. So you can call it a meso scale watershed. It's predominantly row crop production, corn and soybean. And it, it's, a, it's, it's characterized by those glacial aided landscape with really, really low slope. It's, it's, it's super flat basically. It has a really deep soil, really thick soil layers. Uh, we believe the bedrock, the confining layer is about 50 to 100 meters below the surface. Soil here is very fertile and also poorly drained. So you can imagine most of those agricultural lands are tail drained. So I think this is a perfect watershed to study the effect of tail drainage. So the first thing I did is, uh, oh, sorry. So here, what I'm showing you is the weekly river nitrate concentration measured in the past 30 years. So obviously I was not the one and I'm collecting and measure those data. So this data set is provided by Lowell Gentry from uh, my department. So from this data, you can see basically nitrate concentration has strong seasonality in the river, right? So the bottom one actually showing you just an episode of this data set only for two years, you can see um, concentration basically was higher during this springtime, right? So this is about from February to either May or early June, the discharge was also high during this period. But when it hits the peak growing season or early summer, mid-summer, discharge declined by a lot. Concentration also declined by a lot up to almost zero when it hit basically summer or uh, in the fall. And then when uh, the spring comes, the discharge increase again, concentration increase again, 
kind of to close this um, seasonal cycle. With this data set, the first thing I did just to set up a mass balance, you know, um, biogeochemists really like mass balance. So this is the mass balance I have for this MBAR river watershed. So we have input, we have output. Um, as I show in the first equation right here, so the input has fertilizer input, biogeochem uh, bio uh, biological nitrogen fixation, atmospheric nitrogen deposition. So those are my inputs. My outputs have grain export, that just the nitrogen content in those soil, I'm sorry, the corn and soybean grains and get exported beyond the boundary of our uh, watershed. And then river loss, that's what we directly measured. So then denitrification, this is a big one that basically is the microbial uh, reaction that reduce nitrate to um, nitrogen gas. So it's a sink process for nitrate. So the last term right here is change in soil organic nitrogen. So I put a delta sign behind this because to indicate that this term actually can go either positive or negative, right? If you have strong input of fertilizer or uh, fixation and that result in residue input and those residue can be stabilized within the soil. So this could be positive value, meaning that there could be a, a sink process for this nitrogen. But if we have a net loss of soil organic nitrogen through mineralization, this number could be negative and you can almost move this to the left hand side so it become a, a input to this mass balance. And then I rearrange this equation to move this grain export to the left hand side. So a lot of people do that because uh, now you can combine all these terms to define an A and I. An A and I stands for net anthropogenic nitrogen input. And then this is basically balanced by river or export denitrification and also change of soil organic nitrogen. So NA and I is about 35 kilogram nitrogen per hectare per year. That's the average uh, value for the past three decades. And the river export is about 27. So you can see those two numbers are very close to each other. Um, that basically tell our system is very leaky. And uh, most of those input is lost through river. But these basically leave us uh, with the last equation with those two unknowns, denitrification and change of organic nitrogen. I'm sorry, soil organic nitrogen. So we really don't have much idea about those two terms. We really don't know what numbers to expect for those two terms, which I think is, is a bummer. But in my opinion, it also represents an opportunity. Right. If we can place some kind of reasonable constraint, for example, on denitrification, it opened up the window for us to probe this change in soil organic nitrogen, which I think is super, super important in terms of the long term sustainability of these agricultural systems. So the approach we took to basically gain a better understanding of denitrification is uh, through the use of natural abundance nitrate isotopes. So isotopes basically are chemical variants of the same element. So for nitrogen, there are two stable isotopes, 15N and the 14N. You can see basically the number right here. Uh, 14N nitrogen is the dominant one. The 15N is we call the rare isotope. But the relative abundance of those two isotopes can be measured very well. And in the case of oxygen, we have three different stable isotopes, 16, 17, and 18. And 16 oxygen is the most kind of dominant one. So isotope data are expressed using delta notation. That's the equation I have right here. So basically they are relative measure of those uh, percentage of heavier isotope or rear isotope in your sample. Basically it tells you uh, the relative percentage of the heavier isotope in your sample compared to some kind of universal standards. So in case of nitrogen, that's a nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. And in terms of oxygen, that's the oxygen in the standard ocean water. So this delta value can be either positive and negative. Positive values means your sample contain more heavier isotope compared to the standard. And negative means the heavier isotope is basically depleted. So nitrate isotopes can be used as a tool to study the nitrate sources and biogeochemical processes. 
acting on that train. So this is usually being done using this classic candle plot. So it's essentially a biplot of nitrogen, which is the X right here, and oxygen, which is the Y here. So you see a lot of kind of round corner squares here, right, in the, within this plot. Basically, it shows you the isotopic signature for different nitrate sources. So I would like to point out two important sources here. So one is soil ammonium, which is the substrate of mineralization, right? So this for nitrogen, it basically varies between, I would say three per mil to like eight to nine per mil. So the other important source is ammonia in fertilizer. So you can see it basically uh, have a bigger range, right? From about, um, I would say five per mil to like negative 10 per mil. So there is an overlapping between those two sources. But if you see a delta value for delta 15, very negative or close to zero, it had it basically a strong indicator for the uh, fertilizer signal or fertilizer source. Another key feature on this um, plot is those two lines we call denitrification line. So that's essentially because is, is due to the kinetic, we call kinetic isotope effect during this process of denitrification. This is because denitrifying mi microbes um, tend to use those lighter isotopes for this process. As a result, a lot of heavier isotopes are accumulated, you can, or you can say enriched in the residual nitrate. So when a system has strong denitrification, basically this isotope value will rise following a line uh, in this basically candle kind of plot. So what I'm showing here basically is our isotope data collected and measured in Embar River for the last two years. So it's overlapped with uh, concentration data. So the main takeaway here is isotope data follow an op opposite seasonal trend uh, as concentration. So you can see when concentration is really high, right? that's during the spring, the isotope value is very close to zero to two per mil. And then when concentration, it was uh, low and the isotopic uh, value, this is for nitrogen, by the way, it went up by a lot. So the only exception we found uh, is this period. That's the summer and fall of the, of the last year. We know we had a really dry, really fall um, uh, summer and fall last year. And we found that discharge is almost zero in the river, nitrate concentration was almost zero, and we found pretty scattered isotopic signature during this period. But we, 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 we uh, interpret this as some localized repairing activities or some activity within the sediment of river channel. So, but we don't really believe those signals are coming from basically uh, watershed scale, uh, or uh, it does not represent basically activity operating at watershed scale just because this is a really dry period. Another way to look at this data is just to plot nitrogen with oxygen like the candle plot. So here also the color contour tells you the concentration of nitrate. So first you can see those very, very low concentration, right? So that's basically, uh, I don't know what color is this, maybe the gray color, it's pretty much all over the place, but also it has really, really low concentration. Again, we interpret this as a localized effect, but if you remove those low concentration points and only look at basically concentration higher than like one PPM or 1.5 PPM, the isotope value followed a textbook denitrification trend, right? The, that's defined by a line right here. And also you can see up higher up on this line, there's low concentration. And at this, we call the source region, we have really high nitrate concentration. And because we found this denitrification trend, one thing we can do is we can travel those individual points on this figure back to this source region. In another word, we can kind of correct for that denitrification event, uh, effect to really review their source signature for nitrogen. So you can see at this source region, um, it's within this fertilizer signal, right? A uh, fertilizer kind of range, but I, someone, one can also argue that this could be some mixing between fertilizer and the soil organic nitrogen. One thing kind of we did parallel to this river work is to do some kind of um, plot still measurement because we really want to see what kind of signal we can 
we, we can see direct, directly off those telegen outlets. So what we did is to set up some experiment at local scale, we collect a sample directly from tail outlets using East Coast and control kind of units like this. So here is the data. Here is the concentration isotopes and discharge we measured directly from those uh, tail drainage outlets. So it's a quite busy plot, but discharge is shown in the bottom as those gray kind of area. The black line is concentration, red ones for nitrogen isotopes and blue ones for uh, oxygen isotopes. So this is for two years, it's uh, corn soybean rotation. So the first year is corn, the second year is soybean. So those arrows on the top basically indicate the timing for fertilizer application. So one thing we can tell uh, directly from this plot is concentration went up kind of dramatically after the fertilizer input, right? So, but corresponding to that, we found really, really kind of low values, for example, for Delta M15, it went down to negative five mil. We never think any negative that value that negative in the river, but um, this kind of makes sense because this is a localized study. So it's supposed to receive more impact from fertilizer input. Another feature here kind of interesting us is if you look at the non-growing season of corn, right? That's the period before the fertilizer input and also the soybean year, the concentration is kind of stable. It didn't vary too much, right? But if you look at isotopes, it's very flashy. I was uh, very flashy, very responsive to those flow events. Usually we found lower, low isotope values during those peak flow conditions. Just like uh, we did for river, we plot oxygen with nitrogen on this candle plot. And also in this case, we divide all the data into three different kind of seasons. We have basically this black square for corn uh, uh, that's collected during the non-growing season of corn, this blue one that's during the soybean year, and those red circles are for growing season of the corn year. So the main takeaway here is if you just look at the non-growing season of corn and also the soybean, they kind of clustered along a denitrification line, although I would say it's more kind of scattered compared to the river case. But another kind of feature right here is just you see a, a, lot, a lot more variable kind of signature during those corn growing season, right? And also the delta value, especially for nitrogen, get lowered by a lot uh, during this season due to the fertilizer input. So you can do the same thing like we did for the river, just to travel each dot, each, each kind of data point back to their source region. So in this case, the delta M15 for this reconstructed source signature is about positive five per mil to negative five per mil. And I have two basic arrows right here. This one about zero for fertilizers. This one about five per mil for soil organic nitrogen. So those are not from literatures. Those are the real measurements that we took. We basically collected fertilizer, we collected soil cores to measure their delta and 15 value. So uh, you can see basically, again, it's a mixture of those two sources, but I would say during the corn growing season, it mostly reflect those uh, fertilizer signal. So that's pretty much um, all we have in terms of isotopes. Um, I feel that we, uh, it, it's kind of very helpful for us to really figure out those kind of different sources, denitrification, and its uh, significance. We, what, we, what we can tell is we have significant denitrification in our system, and also it's persistent. We always see that no matter when to collect a sample, but that's not enough. So particularly, uh, we don't know how this concentration measurement or isotope measurement can be placed into the context of hydrology, right? That's important. We want to know actually what flow paths contributing to those signal, signals or how uh, nitrogen biogeochemistry vary with hydrological kind of status of the system. Another key point is um, those isotopes only tells us a fraction, right? We can, we can calculate a percentage for, for example, fertilizer nitrogen and also put an arrow bar on it, but it does not tell us biogeochemical nitrogen rates, right? What would be the growth rates of denitrification? What would be the denitrification, uh, I'm sorry, growth rates of 
mineralization. So that being said, we really need to, again, place those measurements into the context of hydrology. And we need a basically a transport, transport model, which can tell us how nitrogen and water interact with each other and control those by geochemical signal. So the approach we took here is a conceptual one. It's called water age modeling. So I believe it is a relatively recent advance in the basically hydrological transport research field, but I, I found it has wide implications or applications to study uh, surface water uh, quality. So in order to talk about water age, we need to first define several rules. So the rule number one is precipitation water always has zero age, okay? But as soon as it hits the surface of a watershed, the clock starts to ticking and those water gets older every second, every, every minute, every year, just like we all do. So um, until, I'm sorry, until the, the, the clock is ticking, until this precipita precipitation water finally reach an outlet of this system. So this outlet could be uh, discharged and also could be ET. So that's being said, if you go out and grab a sample from the river, you, if you can measure its age, you will find the age actually follow a distribution, not a single value. This is, this is just because uh, it, this distribution reflects the precipitation input to the system at different moments in the past, but reach the outlet, basically in this case, the discharge at different timing due to the dispersion effect. So another important concept here is just the difference between water age distribution and storage age di distribution. Water age distribution, just like I said, that's the age distribution in the outflow. It could be discharge, it could be ET, but the storage age distribution refers to the age distribution for those water still reside in the system. Okay, so I always kind of link this using uh, an uh, analogy of uh, demo uh, demography. Is that the right word? Demography. So for example, we have newborns to this world Right, every day with zero age. So at any moment for a certain society, we have a distribution of age for its population. And also people die every day, the age at death is also a population. But in reality, that, that, that the age at death is skewed to an older age, and right? that's a fact. But in hydrological systems, the age distribution could be a lot more variable and this skewness can be toward either younger age or older age, as I will basically show in the following slide. So just to give you some really quick example about this, um, the whole concept, let's just consider a very simple hydrologic system with the precipitation as the only input and the Q and ET as the only two outputs then we can define a storage age distribution for this system and also their distribution for Q and ET. So the dynamics, the variation of those distribution can be described by this mathematical form at the top. So which is a bivariant differential equation. It looks difficult, but the idea behind this equation is very, very simple. So basically it tells the change or variation of the uh, storage age distribution is a function of precipitation input, right? Again, precipitation has zero age and also a function of those Q and ET that leaving the system and how those uh, off, out flows or out fluxes select water of different age from this storage. And the last term of this equation is just the constant agent. Even we don't have any input, don't have any output, water stored in this system get older every day, every second, every minute, right? So the essence of this approach basically is to link the age distribution of those outflows, either Q or ET, to the age distribution of storage. This is achieved by introducing this, uh, we call it storage selection function, which is represented here in this um, uh, omega term, which basically is the ratio of your age distribution in either Q or ET to the age distribution within the storage. So here is a kind of more kind of visual uh, representation of this entire approach. 
Let's say we keep checking precipitation input to our system, right? So if you can measure the storage age distribution, it will look like something like this, basically reflect strong contribution from relatively young water. That's the water arriving this system in the recent past. The reason is simple, just because those old water coming to this watershed long time ago had already been flushed out uh, from the system by Q and ET. So this distribution always emphasize the contribution from young water. So let's say you have Q, you have ET, and they do not, they, they, they try to select particles, water particles from this storage, right? So if the SAS function, this omega term here is one that represents a spatial condition called uniform selection. That just means that the water age distribution in those outflow fluxes is exactly the same as the age distribution within the storage. In another word, in other words, um, those Q and ET is a perfect sample of the entire system. So you can look this into a cumulative way, right? So this is a cumulative um, distribution from zero to one. You see, basically you have, in this case, you have a strong contribution from uh, young water because the slope kind of rising up pretty fast at this young water age, uh, kind of young water range. Of course, you can have bias the selection, right? So for example, the red line right here showing you some young water pre uh, preference, meaning that the queues preferentially select young water from the storage. And this is above this black line right here, which is for the storage. Of course, on the other hand, you can have old water preference, which is represented by this blue line right here. It's for below this storage age distribution just because the young water contribution is less in this case. So we can go on to further parameterize those kind of young water, old water kind of selection behavior by using very simple functions. So in this case, uh, I used a power law equation right here. So this is very simple. Actually, you have the storage age distribution right here, and this is your uh, age distribution for either Q or ET. And these are two related using our exponential uh, power law expo exponent K. So now it's all come down to this K value to tell us it's gonna be young water preference and old water preference. If this K is equal to one, uniform selection, right? Those are perfect sample of the system. But if this K value is larger than one, you're gonna be old water preference. And then if it's lower than one, it's young water preference. So that's, I missed the last slide uh, about this concept before I show you some data, but here is a very important point, just this k value is not constant, but can be variable. A simple example right here is if you consider a precipitation event, when it arrives at the watershed and when the watershed is very, very wet, it actually will kind of mobilize or activate a lot of shallow or near surface flow paths and contribute to a lot of young water to the discharge. But if that same precipitation event, identical duration and intensity, but arrive this system during dry condition, it actually can infiltrate into the system, maybe mobilize and age the water and contribute age the water to the discharge. Again, that means this K value is not a constant, but could be a function of the wetness degree or storage of the system. And a lot of studies have found that there is an inverse storage effect, meaning that when the system is wet, when the system has a large storage, the system tend to select the young water to become discharged. But when the storage is low, a lot of old water preference. So hopefully by this point, you can see that although we model water age, what we essentially hear about here is flow path, right? So this method basically effectively collapse all those complex three-dimensional uh, transport pattern into a one dimension uh, age domain. So then younger age basically reflect shorter and presumably uh, shallower flow paths, but older age means those deep, tortuous, and the really long groundwater flow path, pathways. So we first tested out this concept, this method at the Teldron scale, that exactly the same side we used for our isotope measurement. So one thing clear is we cannot really 
in any idea about water age from water quantity measurement, right? The discharge is not going to tell you anything about water age, but it has to come from some measurements of reactive, I'm sorry, conservative tracers, like passive tracers, for example, like chloride and um, water isotopes. So in our case, we have a very unique chloride data set available for this purpose. So you can see this is the chloride data we collected in the past the seven years. It follow a very clear dilution trend, right, from about like 15 kilogram per liter all the way to like four liter, uh, milligram liter per, uh, I'm sorry, milligram, milligram per liter. And then it went up significantly right after a potash application. That made us realize that those high initial chloride concentration was due to some historical, not I won't say historical, past potash application to this system, for which we really don't know when that happened or how much was applied. But one thing clear is it has been goes through this continuous dilution because chloride has zero kind of concentration in precip precipitation water. So that precipitation water keep kind of flashing the system and cause this dilution trend. Another key feature I want to point out here is you see actually closely if there are a lot of short-term variations in this chloride data set. And especially every time we have a precipitation event, a high flow event, concentration went down by a lot. That seems to tell us there were a lot of young water or even event water kind of contributing to child drainage at those uh, during that period. So basically we used this chloride concentration as constraint to calibrate our SAS function. And what I show on the left is the basically schematic for this model. We consider child drainage, we consider ET, we also consider some deep uh, percolation and exfiltration of groundwater. So the way to do it is we assign an SAS function to each of those flow, um, terms to study their selection behavior. So here, I basically um, skipped all those details about model and showing you directly the calibration result. A lot of things can be talked about here, but I just want to draw your attention to the, to the uh, most left, the left most two panels. The upper one is the calibrated result of the uh, K value for discharge. That's the behavioral um, parameter distribution for the K Q. We have two values here, one for the wettest condition and the other for the driest condition. So you can see during the wettest condition, this K value very, very close to zero, meaning that it has strong young water preference. But during this dry condition, it's increased a lot and very close to one, right? That basically tells us it's more or less a uniform selection. So what we basically can tell from this is there is a strong inverse isotopic effect. When the storage is high, it tends to draw young water, but when it's low, it's, it's very uh, likely to be uniform selection. The other key parameter here is the one at the bottom, this S0. That's the total water storage in this system, which we found is about 1,000 uh, millimeter equivalent uh, water depths. So that's the uh, storage required to provide basically buffering of water mixing and chloride mixing in our system. So here is the model basically fitting uh, between uh, the simulated values and also observed the value. You can tell that the model performed pretty well. It can basically reproduce very well the gradual dilution trend and also can reproduce those short-term variations that basically event scale. Um, here are the water age results we retrieved from the calibrated SAS model. So on the top, if you look at the left, on the top is precipitation, ET, and also the second row is uh, discharge. And what at the bottom is the median age for tile drainage. Remember that every day we have a distribution of age, right? Then we can look at the 50 percentile and really that, that's our median age for each day. You can see this medium age actually is very flashy and it has some correspondence with the Q. Actually, it follow a kind of uh, reverse or anti-correlation with Q. Every time you have a high flow, you have a young water. So what's shown on the left, right, I'm sorry, is we call it marginal age distribution. That's just the average age, age distribution for this past seven years. That's 
averaged um, by uh, weighting those individual daily age distribution using tail drainage, tail discharge. So you can stick it uh, in cumulated form, right, from zero to one. You see this is a line right here, but I want to point, find out that this is in log scale. So one, 10, 100 days, 1,000 days, right? So from this plot, it, it, first of all, it represents the average behavior of the system in terms of water mixing and water selection. And then you can look at the 15 percentile. So the mean uh, median age is about 100 days. That's basically a value across the three tiles we studied. On the other hand, you can also look at this, set up a threshold value, for example, 10 days, right? On average, uh, this young water fraction could be 20% or 30% in the past seven years, meaning that 20 to 30% of tail drainage is actually coming from precipitation in the past 10 days. On the other hand, we can also have very old age, right? Age older than 1,000 days, which can also be a, a substantial fraction about 15% to 10%. So here is a plot. Basically, I showed the relationship between tile discharge with medium age. Again, it showed this inverse relationship. When you have high flow, you have young water. So here on the left is the age, medium age versus daily nitrate load. So it's kind of interesting that it follows an exponential decay pattern. When you have a lot of uh, high flow, young water, the load is actually increased exponentially. So again, this is grouped into three different phases. So I just want to point out this one right here, the black uh, square right here, it's during the growing season. Uh, you can see it's very kind of responsive to this age variations. And I can also tell that those dots reflect, have the highest fertilizer signal from our isotope measurements. So here, um, just our kind of conceptual summary of this SAS modeling. So we believe the strong young water preference and inverse storage effect is from a presence of extensive vertical preferential flow paths. Doing recognitions for rising land or peak flow of the hydrograph, those preferential pathways get activated and really contribute a lot of young water from surface soil layer to tail drainage. But during this recession period, um, those young water is kind of retained in the surface layer, but only those deep and a, a longer and deeper flow paths remain connected with tail drain and contributing kind of old water to tail discharge. Remember, the storage was estimated to be about 1,000 millimeter in our system. Assuming a typical porosity of 0.3 to 0.7, um, this means that actually the storage can be as deep as three meter on the surface. And our tail line is only 1.2 to 1.5. That basically means there is large storage actually below the tail lines that can still contribute salute and water to tail drainage. And this storage has really kind of slow um, hydrological turnover, turnover rate. So we can almost think it as a legacy store or passive store in this case. Here is what um, we try to kind of link isotope results with this water age result. So we basically calculated, we call denitrification fraction. So I don't really think I have time to go through the details about this um, calculation, but it basically is the idea that following the denitrification line, higher up on that line, uh, more denitrification the sample had gone through. So correspondingly, you will have a higher denitrification fraction. So we found Denitrification has a positive correlation with median age at the tile drain scale. This is still at the tile drain scale. So this kind of makes sense, right? So if you have long water age, those nitrate has longer contact time with organic matter, with soil microbes. So there's higher chance the nitrate get denitrified. On the other hand, if you have lower, um, younger water, shorter flow paths, so the denitrification could be less. So this basically, this correlation really tell that there is a inherent linkage between water age or water travel time with the reaction time scale of denitrification. Next thing we did, just upscale everything we kind of did in scale to the watershed scale. 
So in this case, we combine the SAS modeling with some conceptual rainfall runoff modeling. Because now we are at watershed scale, we need two reservoirs, one for Luzon, the other one for uh, groundwater. In this case, we also con uh, consider a passive storage in the groundwater to really represent the hydrological legacy effect. So here is the result. So we found the model can reproduce the discharge fairly well. You can see the net circulative um, coefficient is above 0.3, uh, I'm sorry, 0.7 in this case. And also the model can reproduce pretty well. I would say the uh, chloride variation we found in the river. So the, this coefficient is about 0.5, but it can basically reproduce those strong seasonal pattern of chloride in the river. So here's the water age result from the uh, calibrated SAS model. So on the top is the median age during the past 30 years. And the, at the bottom is we call young water fraction. That's the fraction of water coming in the past 90 days in the river water. So I, I kind of find this interesting because when I was at uh, SWAP working with Tim, I heard him talking about this 2012 drought a lot of times. So you can see from this retrieved water age, actually it has a really broad peak, basically during the summer of 2012, I believe due to the drought stress in this region. So another thing is it has a flat top. This peak has a flat top. Um, this is basically because we lumped or we grouped all those water older than 10 years into this 10 year pool. So that actually means water can get much older during that time period, during the drought. And on the other hand, during this 2008, probably pretty much to 2011, I know there were a lot of flood flooding events in this region, and we can really tell the water age get lower by a lot during this kind of wet period. Here is a plot. Basically, we showed the age and concentration relationship at the watershed scale. So the y x, I'm sorry, the x axis is the age. Right? Again, it's in log scale from one day to more than one thousand day, and the y is nitrate concentration. You can. You can tell pretty clearly that there is kind of turning point behavior right here, right? So concentration go up basically when uh, 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 concentration was really low when water age was really old and basically concentration go up when water gets younger and kind of hit a threshold right here. It's about one fifth, I would say 150 days to 200 days. So, okay, it, remember at the tail drain scale, we found the tail drain energy is about eight, 100 days. So they're not exactly the same, but it seems to imply that tail drain energy, once it's get activated at the watershed scale, is the main player here that contribute to the nitrate concentration in the river. It's also interesting that when we exceed that threshold, concentration went down by a lot. We don't really know exactly why, causing this decline trend, but possible reasons could be overland flow or could be uh, extensive preferential flow that caused some dilution or caused some kind of uh, source limitation when this, uh, the, the entire system really gets wet up and flow was really, really high. So um, this is kind of something we are currently doing. So now we are um, moving away from using chloride as our tracer because uh, actually, there are uncertainty in, in the chloride because um, you need to know its input. You need to gather basically potash fertilizer sales record for the county, for the uh, state, and we know there is an uncertainty in that. But in this case, we start to use water isotopes as our tracer to study the SAS or, or the water mixing or selection behavior. So in this case, we have an ESCO at the audit of our system collecting samples at daily scale. So every day we collect the sample and measure its water isotopes. So you can see this is preliminary. preliminary. We only started in the spring of last year. And also, like I said, we had a really dry summer and this fall. So I don't really know what we too much can be tell from this figure right here, but you can almost see that when the discharge went down, this is the oxygen isotope of water. It went up, seems to tell that there is switching or um, I don't know, uh, different flow paths contributing to discharge during this period. And interestingly, you can see those kind of little bumps 
right, along, around this course. So that corresponds to precipitation event very well. Every time we have a, had an event, we see a little bump or deviation from the baseline. That seems to suggest young water contribution to um, discharge, uh, even during this very dry period. So we now also have high frequency uh, nitrate concentration at the, um, at the outlet. So that gave us 15 minute um, nitrate concentration data. So uh, we expect that gonna tell us a lot about dynamics for age or nitrogen concentration at those uh, short time scale, like event scale. That's pretty much um, what I wanna show and share for today. Um, I think uh, what we have been doing kind of only scratched the surface here, maybe, maybe less than scratching the surface. So what we actually plan to do in the next is really to integrate those isotopes with this uh, water transport and mixing modeling. So to, to, to make the model not only able to select water, but also able to select nitrogen. So this can be achieved by de design or designate the entire soil uh, reservoir or Luzon reservoir into two different phases, one for immobile phase, the other for marble phase. So water selection basically occur in this marble phase, but we can model a lot of uh, geochemical cycling of nitrogen within this marble phase, and there can be exchange of nitrogen and water between those two phases. Very importantly, all those nitrogen processes as shown right here has been characterized, has been quantified for their either nitrogen or oxygen isotope effect. That means we can not only model the concentration, but also can model the isotopic signature resulting from those processes. So eventually this, our vision is not only select water, but also select concentration and their isotopes. Hopefully they can provide a lot more constraint to us to better constrain the mass balance, the nitrogen, uh, the denitrification and ultimately the change of soil organic nitrogen in our system. So just to sum up, um, we found um, nitrogen in river water cell drainage is sourced from both current year fertilizer and also mineralization of soil organic matter. We found water mixing and selection behavior in cell drain system can be characterized by a strong young water preference and also a um, inverse storage effect that seems to apply, imply that the hydrological legacy effect is very minor uh, in our system. And Finally, we found that combining this isotope measurement with water age modeling has the potential basically to unravel complex hydrobiogeochemical mechanisms, um, maybe ultimately contribute to a unified theory for modeling coupled water and salute in hydrological systems. So with that, I would like to thank um, my postdoc, my students. Um, they basically did all the hard work and I would like to thank Lowell Gentry, Corey Mitchell from my department to provide those tail drainage and long-term river data. So um, funding for this work is mainly from the Illinois Nutrient Research and Education Council, some uh, hedge funds of USDA, and also the startup fund provided by my college and my department. So thank you everybody for your attention. And I'm just happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks so much, Janji. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll open it up to questions. Tim, I got a question for Janji. Oh, go ahead, Satish. A very nice presentation. I uh, really enjoyed it. And some of your work kind of matches with uh, some of the stuff we have done. Uh, if you go back to your slide on concentration versus uh, age. Yeah, right there. So are you basically going back to Van Meter's paper, are you saying that almost all the nitrogen that's going into the river just goes out in 365 days? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, can you say it again? I'm sorry. Okay. You are saying right here, 150 days or 196 <clears throat> days, you had some, uh, the most of the nitrogen that is going out of the land, from the fertilizer or the organic matter mineralization 
leaves the landscape in less than 365 days. Because when meter says it's sitting there for 30 years, and you are not showing it for 30 years. So, so um, here, basically that's the median age for individual water pathway we collected at the outlet. Um, like I said, we looked at water age, but we essentially care about flow path. So one thing I can tell from here is um, we don't really know, for example, this threshold value, right? That's corresponding to 100 or 150 days. So we don't really know what that represents. It could be tail drainage, it could be something else, but our method do not have spatial resolution here. It's essentially a lumped approach. It just tell us that this particular water uh, flow path or a group of flow paths contributed to most nitrogen in the river. So that's basically uh, at the time scale of 150 to 200 days. Um, it also depends on when that flow path get activated. If it's summer, or uh, it may not. You see, you, you can see it's also right. It's also spent a range. For example, in the bottom could be, you know, uh, the flow paths activated during summer, but those uh, at the top could be activated during the spring fertilizer period. So again, you, you had another slide where you showed 196 days. Could you bring that up, please? 96 days? 196 uh, days. Yeah, right here. This one? Yeah. So you are showing the medium age. Yeah, medium age. Medium age. So going back to Van Meter's paper that you started with. Yeah. What's the answer for uh, from your research? Is it nitrogen sitting in the soil for 30 years? Um, yes, there, there are definitely water like 30 years, but at the same time, nitrogen concentration was really low in those um, old water, right? So if you go back to um, uh, this part right here, most of this part of um, water is very old. It's from maybe from deep groundwater aquifers, but also it has really low nitrate concentration. Oh, okay, <laughs> so that... That's why I was trying to get there that most of the nitrogen leaves the nitrogen added from the fertilizer or the organic matter leaves in less than 360 days. There's always going to be some water from the last year and the year before. Yes. But that quantity is relatively less. So going back to Van Meter's paper, it cannot be 30, 30 years that is accumulating as, she, as they have said. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> I totally agree. Like I said, I, I believe our system has minor hydrological legacy effect. One from one reason is the tail drainage speed up the flushing. The other reason is those old water are depleted in nitrate due to denitrification. And that's still very well in our isotope data. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Other questions for Jaji? Uh, nice presentation. Are you, are you working mainly in a corn system or is it a corn soybean system? And if, it, if you do have soybeans in your system, do you see changes in your signatures when you do that rotation? So I, I didn't hear the question very well, but I guess it was about crop rotation. If I see any differences between corn and soybean years, is that correct? Okay, so uh, I guess um, this is our result. So um, first of all, we, we, we saw high concentration, high load in general during corn years. And we saw fertilizer signals during this year as well. Um, corn bean year, actually corn bean year. So um, I don't really have a plot here. Sometimes it can be, the total load can be higher during corn year. Um, that could be due to legacy effect from previous year, I didn't really um, look into that effect, but I would just say, um, I, I didn't see any difference in terms of water age, but we definitely saw um, different concentrations, different isotopic signatures um, due to the crop rotation in the system. Is that the next, what is the next slide? 
Should we go to the next one? Uh, the next one? This one right here? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Any any questions about this plot? No, I'm, no, I'm just I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, we found corn non-growing seed and soil being kind of similar, right? They are. This is the black one here, blue one here. Follow a lot here. And during fertilizer season, you see a lot of fluctuations and towards fertilizer signal. And also we know there are higher concentration during this time period as well. So I will interpret this as a mixing of fertilizer nitrogen and um, organic nitrogen. So this actually have a implication for the biogeochemical legacy effect that the meter they talked about, but I just feel it's kind of premature to conclude anything, but at least based on our study, we definitely see signal of nitrogen from current year fertilizers, right? So um, from a management perspective, or, or this nitrogen is young, you can say it's young nitrogen, right? From a management perspective, we may do a better job to kind of reduce this nitrogen fertilizer. I don't really think we can do much about the lex, biogeochemical legacy effect, but if we can stop or reduce that fertilizer input, um, that may also reduce the total loads. And also that kind of have implication because we link this to preferential flow. So soil physical condition may play a really big role uh, in nitrogen loading from our system. So I think that's our um, main takeaway from, 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 from this data. John, do you have a question? Um, so you're also measuring isotopes in nitrous oxide. And so yeah. I'm wondering if there's a link between that signal in the atmosphere and any legacy effect at the land surface. So can, can you make a link there? Is there a legacy effect related to the N2O emissions that we see in the atmosphere? It's, 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 a, it's, it's a great question. That's actually what we are trying to do, just to better link this um, hydrological transport with nitrogen signal, because we measure nitrous oxide in river water that they give us additional constraint on denitrification in groundwater systems. I cannot tell too much because we just got the data, but what we can tell is we did two samplings, one in May, one in November. You remember last November is, was super dry we found very different isotopic signature in our nitrous oxide dissolved in river water. Seems to, again, tell us some flow path variation between those two seasons. But maybe we can discuss later <laughs> right, for our project. So yeah, we, we have a lot of things to potentially look at using that data set, so. Any final question? Yes, I have I a got a follow. Am I got a follow-up question? Oh, go ahead, Satish. Yeah, could you go back to that uh, median uh, age graph over there, please? Uh, which one, at town trend scale or river? Where you had 150 days. 150 days, okay. Yeah, approximately. You just showed that graph. This one? Yeah, right here, right here. So now you have a nitrate concentration versus median age. You also have median age versus water, right? Discharge, right? Yeah. So I think it'll be very useful if you plot this graph in terms of total load, nitrogen load that's going in the river. Okay. Because that's what people are interested in. They want to know, you know, what percent of the nitrogen load in a given year is yeah. from one year. So, so if I, I, I haven't done that, but if I would like to speculate, I would say the relationship could be, um, let me see, I'm trying to draw here. Um, uh, it could be, it could be followed the same pattern because older age usually has lower discharge. And then it goes up like this and then maybe level off like this, just because 
although we have lower concentration during this young water, but it also has higher discharge. The load could be kind of stable at this uh, young water end or range, or I, I don't know, the high discharge range. So, Well, I think it goes back to Van Meter's paper that you started with. We got to we have, we got to have a good handle as to the uh, how much of the nitrogen that's staying in the soil that's coming back, like they're saying 30 years. I don't believe that. The nitrogen cannot stay in the soil for 30 years unless it's converted into organic matter, but overall our soils have very high organic matter and they're mineralizing. So, so that, that's a question you need to, if you can answer it, that'll be great. Uh, I think based on what we have so far, we can not answer, but that's what we plan to do by building those biogeochemical processes into the water age model. Up to by that time, hopefully we can have a better answer to the question. Yeah. I, I have a question. Thanks, thanks for the presentation. Thanks for the presentation. Um, you know, I'm quite interested in the um, in the signature from the fertilizer uh, and whether you can separate the uh, the effect of you know nitrogen that has been immobilized. Uh, we know from a lot of studies that there is quite a bit of immobilization of uh, fertilizer nitrogen that happens when you have corn residue, especially. Um, and just wondering if if you are able to separate that, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, once it's immobilized and then mineralized again and potentially uh, leached, uh, if you can completely separate that. Answer is no. <laughs> okay. Because, well, and 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 so the reason I'm interested in this is I'm actually doing some M15 work right now. I'm starting to do some additional work. We started doing some a few years ago, and uh, I'm prepping right now to look at um, not only immobilization but also um, ammonia fixation in in the soil, and hopefully be able to you know trace where the fertilizer is going, you know, how much of it actually ends up in water or N2O or ammonia, but also uh, how much of it ends up actually in the soil. Because we normally talk about, well, if it's no recovery, it's lost, but uh, we don't really know how much of that actually gets, you know, fixed or immobilized. Yes, so, but I assume you use the label tracer approach, right? So, but in this case- this Yeah, is, yeah, we, we will be using M15 for that. Yeah, yeah, natural abundance, we can only tell current year fertilizers applied in the current year. So actually this blue arrow right here, so organic nitrogen, that could be due to fertilizer input in the past year, but just lost its new, with a new, newest, its, its signal doing those immobilization and uh, mobilization process, cycling or processes. So again, we can only tell the loss of fertilizer applied in the current year. So that's kind of limitation of this approach uh, the, the the upside is we don't need to apply any tracers. That's natural occurring. So. Yeah, yeah. And I was also uh, curious about the uh, chloride one that you showed. They decrease over time substantially, and then you apply potassium. So was that uh, a field where it had been, um, you know, uh, potassium chloride was applied for a number of years before 2014, and then there was no application for a number of years. Is that how that happen? I I don't I actually I, I don't know. I mean there was a owner switching during that period. We believe it is. It is the reason for this um high concentration at the, at, the, at the beginning because we saw this jump of chloride right after potash application. So that made us think that this was due to fertilizer input in the past. Could be right, if, right, 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 right before this 2015, but we really don't. I, I was just a little surprised because you know, I mean, chloride moves pretty quickly, just 